Welcome to Gumball Love. I'm Melissa Ledger, professional relationship coach, creator of Gumball Love, and the Back to You Academy. If you're ready to stop the cycle of toxic men, get through the breakup once and for all, and finally get back to you, you are in the right place. This journey is about healing your heart, and you are encouraged to take the pace that is just right for you. In the process, you will build a foundation of confidence and strength that will make you unshakable, I promise. So get ready to level up your mindset and your lifestyle as you awaken the seeds of greatness just waiting to burst into full bloom. Let's do this. Welcome back to another episode of Gumball Love. I'm your host, Melissa Ledger. All right, today I have a very special guest, Christina Pearson. She is a certified dating coach. She has created the, or it has created the Dream Girl Academy, which is coming out this fall. She also has created the Manifest Your Dream Guy ASAP free workbook. She does one-on-one coaching and she has the most fun Instagram account. The reels are hilarious and her take on online dating, millennial dating. We get into everything on this episode and I was blown away. Like I thought I had a pretty good idea of who Christina was. And when we get into this interview, I was like, this girl has so much to offer. And we had such incredible discussions. I could have talked to her for another hour and or more because she was so interesting and just has a different take on things really you've challenged me on a lot of ideas that I had. And we just, I don't know, we just got into so many great things. So I can't wait for you guys to meet her because she's somebody I want in your feed. I want you to follow her and hear this type of content. She has a way of, I don't know, I haven't mastered the reels. You guys, I need to like get my my reel game on, but I'm going, going to um, outsource my reels to Christina because she has just got, the, she's got it down. But she makes it uh, funny and but also real and there's always a message behind the humor and it just just helps you in this journey if you're online dating and you feel like you're it's never going to end you don't know what to look for she helps you look for the red flags in just a different way than I do so sometimes you know I want to introduce you to different coaches because I may not be the coach for you but Christina might be the perfect fit so if you hear her and you're like you know what this sounds like somebody that's more it's going to click more with me I want you to find love. I want you to stop the cycle of what we call sugar high romance. I want you to stop this feeling like you're meeting somebody only to find out it's not the right person. And that's, that's the whole goal. So we're in this together and I would love, I'd love to bring Christina into your life, into your feed, and maybe you guys can work together in the future. So we'll have all of her links in the show notes. So without further ado, here is Christina Pearson. So how did this all begin for you? Where was your aha moment? Was it a bad breakup? Was it the the wrong guy? Or where was that moment where you were like, something's off? And because I know we never think we're going to end up being coaches at this point. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I can't really I can't really say that there was just one. It was like multiple things that happened at separate times. And then and then like it kind of just meshed together. So I knew three years ago, I knew that I wanted to do something creative online. I knew I wanted to do some sort of blogging or video creation or something like I knew that I wanted to do something creative. I was a makeup artist for 10 years. And like, you know, I just, I wanted something else that, that, you know, Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I worked for a big brand for most of that time. And I was just like, I want to do something creative online. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And I thought to myself, it's fine. The universe is going to send me an idea. When there's an idea, the the idea is going to come my way. And I was giving one of my girlfriends some advice. She was um, having a fight with her boyfriend. I was giving her advice. I was texting her. I was giving her word for word. This is what you're going to say. This is how you're going to react. And she goes, wow, you're really good at this. And I said, yeah, I'm pretty good for someone who can't get a text back. And I went, Oh my God. And I shot to Instagram and I was like, I've been obsessed with dating since I'm in high school. I mean, I read the book, why men love bitches. I stole it from my mom. 
in high school and I read it in one, in one weekend. I was, in, I was like 15 or 16. I read it in one weekend. I've always been the go-to friend yeah. for dating relationship advice. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know, but it just, of course, I didn't think of that when I was thinking that I wanted a new creative outlet, just, you know, as a hobby. And I went, oh my goodness, can't get a text back. That's a great name for a blog. So I went to Instagram, the handle was available. The website was available, everything. So I started making content just blog posts, little videos here and there. And at the same time, I met my now boyfriend, Joe, and I met him. I didn't, I I wasn't really sure it was going to go somewhere serious. I mean, I was really in a good place where I just didn't care. It was like, if I meet somebody great, but I didn't care so much. And little did I know that being with him and being in such like a happy, healthy relationship after putting in so much work was actually going to push me in that direction even further. Because at first I was like, oh, well, it's just this single girl who's giving dating advice. Like, oh, I can't get a sex back. I mean, that's where the name comes from, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but meanwhile, I, I was, da- I started dating him at the same time and I was just learning so much about, I had this perspective from both sides of it all of a sudden that I didn't think I was going to have. So being with Joe really, I mean, and, and it's inspires, you know, what I, what I do still, and I'm sure it will continue to, but just like being in something that was so healthy and felt so easy to get into was really, uh, you know, my second aha moment. And then where the third one came in is late last year. I mean, all of last year was really weird. I'm like, people aren't really dating, like what's happening right now. And I just kind of fell off. I was like, I'm not feeling inspired. I don't want to make stupid little Instagram posts. Nobody's reading (laughs) blogs as much as they used to. And I just kind of fell off. And then, but I, I kept getting, uh, DMS to, my inbox asking for dating advice over and over and over again. And, and I thought to myself, why am I not coaching? Like, it felt like something that was so big and scary to do. Um, but I was like, that, that's, that's what I, that's what I want to do. So I decided to just pursue it and start putting myself out there. And now it's something that I'm able to take full advantage of. And I know that's like a long story. (laughs) No, that's good. Yeah. That that's really, I mean, there, there there wasn't just one aha moment. It was really just like Mm -hmm. a culmination of a few different things that kind of led me to this path. And who knows, maybe there'll be another aha moment at some point and it'll veer in another direction. Yeah. So before Joe, was it, did you have like were you in the can't get a text back? I know I've certainly lived in the can't get a text back. I love <laughs> this. This is what I've explained to my, my love, my life. Ian, I'm like, you don't understand. There's like, they don't text back. Like I've, I'm ex- <laughs> I've explained all these games. So were you living in that world where it was confusing and you, you guys weren't texting back or what was that like before Joe? Where I was before I met him was I was in a long period. I want to say I really g- gave myself like a year and a half where there was just like, no one. And I just didn't care, but I was never much of a dater. And even now I don't tell my clients that they should date a lot. I've even told clients to go on less dates. If I think they're going on too many dates, Yeah, I don't love online dating. I never did. I'm not saying not to use it or that it doesn't work. It's just more of like, if you hate it, don't do it <laughs> like right. if you hate yeah. it that much. Don't do it. But really I fell more into this like millennial casual dating culture. You know, I think that I I don't know where it started, maybe somewhere in the nineties where it was this, like women are naggy and women need to be cooler when it comes to dating and a little more go with the flow. So you try to do this, go with the flow thing and be this cool girl. And what ends up Mm -hmm. happening is you're not getting anything you want because you're just, um, you know, you're not hardwired that way to really be casual and just be cool. And, you know, they say like, Oh, date like a man, like, no, (laughs) it's not, it doesn't work. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Steve Harvey. Damn you. (laughs) I know. Yeah. Yeah, Act like a lady, think like a man. So then you're like, okay. So because for me, the challenge was following dating advice. I always lost myself in that advice. It, and I even loved the book, why men love bitches, but then it was like, then, and you know, you're, she actually isn't telling you to be an actual bitch, but Mm -hmm. there were things like I really remember from that book is don't make anything, just get a bag of popcorn. (laughs) Do you remember this part in the book? Like pop a bag of popcorn and then like, (laughs) and then just hand it. Like, here's my effort. You came over to watch a movie and I'm going to Jiffy pop. That's my effort. And then I'm not even going to take it out of the bag. And I, I knew like, that's not me, but there was something I'm similar to you. Like I have every dating book. I was a little bit older than you. And I found (laughs) men, why men love bitches. But like, yeah, I was just consuming that content because it was, I was obsessing over 
what is, is there a secret? Is there something to this? And I, I'm just fascinated by the process. And that's why, that's why I reached out to you because I'm just fascinated by everyone's perspective, but you're right. There was, there is a feeling like that's a really good, like a go with the flow. And so we're trying to navigate all these messages and these inboxes of you know, um, Bumble and match and we're overwhelmed by all these apps. And I find this too with clients that it's, I I'm so happy to hear you say dating less because it does feel overwhelming. I think to so many people. Um, so before I forget, where are you, where are you from originally? Like how, where'd you grow up? How did, where, where did this, um, like, you know, where, where'd you grow up? parents? Did you have like parents divorce or was there something that sparked your interest in relationships in general from the beginning? Yeah, I, I grew up, um, you know, in, in New York city, not in Manhattan, but I, I was born in Brooklyn and I've spent most of my time in, uh, Staten Island and New Jersey. And now I live back in Staten Island. So I'm in New York. And, um, yeah, I mean, I picked up, I picked up why men love bitches. My mom was single, you know, I, uh, yeah. you know, my parents divorced when I was a baby. I mean, I was barely two years old. They divorced. And, uh, I, you know, from the time I was eight until now, I really haven't had much of a, a relationship with my dad. I do have a wonderful stepdad and he, him and my mom have been together for 20 years, but it, it that, that, I'm happy that you asked that because I, I've been doing a lot of podcasts and nobody's really asked that before, you know, about, about childhood. And that has so much to do with all of our dating and all of our, our all of our love lives. Like, you know how that is. Like it, it does have so much to do with your love life. And, you know, I think being with a single mom who like killed it, I mean, she was killing it when we were kids, she was working so hard, she was making money. She was her own, her own boss for the most part, you know, and that was so great in some aspects, but I did have this, like, I'm a modern woman. I don't need a man. I really should not rely on a man. I should not think that I can rely on a man. Mm -hmm. And that is actually not as healthy as it is portrayed to be, you know? Oh, yeah. See, I was, I'm so glad you said that, but I was just kind of feeling this from you because I feel like I've been dying to have this conversation with someone. (laughs) We get it. Okay. So I know Ian's like, I'm so sick of hearing this, but I made him, I made him watch 50 shades of gray. So let me just see what you think, but that's made him watch. It's like, you have to see, because when, I don't know about you, maybe you weren't in the coaching vein when that movie came out, but I remember, cause I don't read fiction. So I, I was like, it. why are women reading this book? I was thinking, I feel like women are not like, we're not going to make stuff about porn and we're all going to flock to the theater. So I was like, what, what is going on? And I felt this sense of like mother henning all these women, like, what are you doing? Because I had heard all these bad things about the movie. And then I get there and I'm like, Oh, it's the bad boy that she converts. Mm -hmm. She makes the bad boy fall in love with her. And if we follow, I mean, sorry, but you know, spoiler alert, (laughs) but you know, at the end, Christian gray falls in love. Right. So she changes this abusive, controlling narcissist sociopath. I mean, he's a complete psycho. Right. So I feel like though, the reason it's so appealing is because we are craving like manly men. Mm -hmm. And so people are going, I mean, how many went to 50 million people bought the book. So we're craving that yet. We, I, I grew up with a single mom as well. My parents divorced when I was young. And so the same thing where you feel like I, I shouldn't need a man, but, but then there's, this is what I want to ask you. What do you think of? So we have the, we grew up with a fairy tale for those of us. I think a lot of us grew up with single moms. Mm -hmm. And then we see like the 50 shades of gray. I don't need a man yet. I want a boyfriend. I want to, I want, it's like, we want these things yet. We're like, I am woman. Hear me roar. How do you feel like when you said when it's not as healthy, how do you balance those things as we're all getting barraged with those, you know, images or ideas? So, I mean, this could even be said, I don't know if you watched uh, sex life on Netflix, but it's a very similar situation. No. So you have to, I mean, you have to watch it. Okay. I was resistant because I thought it was very fish, 50 shades of gray, but the storyline is way better. So just, oh. it has a similar storyline where, you know, she's kind of just attracted to this, to this bad sort of toxic, but the sex is amazing sort of, sort of thing. Right. Okay. And I think what happens is, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say, don't, 
if you want to be like a CEO, quote unquote, boss babe, or, or whatever it is, I'm not saying don't do that. But what's happening is we are leading, we are coming to men with a wall in front of us already. We don't know how to be vulnerable and soft and, and we don't know how to be charming anymore. So, you know, we've been told that being charming and being vulnerable is being weak and that's not true. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, in order to attract a manly, like masculine, like healthy masculine man yes, is to show that softness and that vulnerability but to still have boundaries, you can have boundaries while still being charming and sweet. And while, and while giving appreciation to a, to a man, you can mm-hmm. still do that. It, you know, we lead with our masculine selves, which are our like logical analytical business selves. We lead with everything we bring to the table that spoiler alert, men don't care that much about what you do for a living. They don't. Mm. They, they'll appreciate it. Of course, like they should appreciate, they should respect it. But I've never heard a guy complain about his girlfriend because she's not driven enough at her job. Mm. Never, ever mm. once, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's just really like when it came to when, like, for example, when I met Joe, my, my position in, in the, the makeup company that I was in, I was in a position where I was doing re- really well. I was getting promotions and I cared very much about that part of my life, but it wasn't the thing that I led with. I led with my passion for what I was doing. Not like I, I make my own money and I'm in a, independent and I don't need a man. I didn't lead with that part of myself. Instead, it was like, I'm so passionate, like about my job. And like, I'm just so happy to be doing this. And these are the parts of it that I, that I really like. And it's like, Mm -hmm. he knew, obviously he knew that I was able to take care of myself, but it wasn't in a way where it was like, I don't have the space in my life to let somebody strong walk in and contribute. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this, this is such a powerful take on because I struggle with the masculine and the feminine energy Mm -hmm. only, only because it's, I don't want to see girls change who they are Mm -hmm. to then be like, Oh, I've got to be in my masculine or my feminine. But I like that you present it. This is still me, Mm -hmm. but I'm just not going to walk in. Like I am woman, hear me roar because I think you and I have both discovered as you find the man that really loves you and you really love him that they are not sitting there in judgment. Like, you know, you see, oh, this is what it's like to be with somebody who actually cares about me and nurtures me. So when you, but when you show up with a little bit of a softer side and I even hesitate on saying that, but I, I just moved out of New York after living there for seven years. So I'm still like, I'm my heart aches that I'm not in New York. It's the whole thing that I'm dealing with. <laughs> so I hate and I'm, I'm trying, not- I'm trying to leave. So <laughs> are you really? Oh man, I know. I know. I'm like, I'm just like hanging on, but I do see people leaving and I just, oh, I love New York so much. And, and I know it's not the normal New York that yeah. <laughs> we, we knew we once knew, but anyway, yeah. that's another, another story. But, um, I always felt like New York women were, were the most, the softest women I knew with the hardest exteriors. Like they just Mm -hmm. came in with, and, and maybe that's, maybe that's how I can reconcile this masculine feminine, uh, because people are like, well, when you're in your masculine, you're in your doing, when you're in your feminine, you're in your feeling. And so I remember my old self and I would have overanalyzed the crap out of that until then I had no idea which one was which or what in my flow. Like that's, I don't want to get girls in that mindset of, I don't know which one. And maybe I'm being too much because then you get into that. I'm too much this and not enough of that. So I wanted to, I'm trying to figure out like, what is that balance of I'm being myself, but I'm also not leading. And maybe I think the way you just put it, don't lead with the walls that Mm -hmm. you have up. Yeah. It's typically a wall. You're leading, yeah. you're giving your, what's happening then is you're giving what you want somebody to give to you, not what they want from you. Like, I, I hope that that made sense, but like, you know, 
you have to always consider, and this is even just a good exercise in general, just how you should approach everybody, whether it's a romantic interest, a new friend, a coworker, think about like, what would make them feel really nice right now? And it's, and if Mm -hmm. that means that you're going to allow their masculinity to show through and you're going to like appreciate that. And you're just going to be open to just receiving whatever energy they give you and then reacting to it. Like that's a good way to be, to be about it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, it's questioning yourself. It usually is a wall. You're trying to boast about something that you want them to boast about to you, or you want to, it's the side you want to see from them. So if you're bragging about like your job, your account, like leading with your accomplishments, it's because you want to know what their accomplishments are. You want them to know, you want to know what they're bringing to the table in that aspect. But most of the time, and obviously we're speaking generalities, everybody's different, right? I mean, like, right, this right. is just, you know, unfortunately it's just the way you have to do things. You know, you speak mm-hmm. in generalities, but sure, most of the time he's not, that's not what he cares to know about you. And that part of you, you also have to, to think like when you go on dates, you, you know, it's another thing about being like too much of an open book. There's a difference between being vulnerable and then being too much of an open book. Allow them to get to know you, allow them to earn the privilege of really knowing those things about you. You can keep it light when you first meet, you know, just talk about like passions, what makes you happy, the exciting parts of your job, you know, instead of being like, like, it's just, there's so much of like, what can, what I can bring to the table when like, that's not, that's not a question yet. Right. And having fun. It should be fun. Right. I know whenever I coach people, I'm like, you know, it's supposed to be fun. And so your dates shouldn't be, um, you, you'll get to all the things, but you don't have to get to them all right now. And I think like, especially in New York, people felt like I got to get all these things. (laughs) Go and watch these girls. Like I got to learn all these things about this guy. And it's like, okay, but what is the, are you in a panic? Are you in a rush? Like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be. Yeah. So like, Okay. You're actually helping me. Cause I've been so like anti-masculine feminine and that I hated those buckets, but it's actually more of it getting more in the flow of that fun and not talking about the walls that you have up, not talking about your ex, not talking about like, sometimes even guys do this. They show up on dates and they're like, so what are you looking for? you know, like, tell me your list. It's like, I always right. felt that that was super awkward. And of course it was insecure guys wanting you to tell them everything they are so that they right. feel like they check off all those boxes. Right. But I think a lot of times dating has become such a, like, I have, I have a girl who said she's been going on dates with guys that are divorced and they are literally going through, this is my, my, uh, they're, they're asking them about financial setups and how the kids are like, even, even into almost what would seem like a prenuptial agreement kind of thing. It's like, what is good? She's like, what is this a thing where they're almost like going through the list before we've even like, I'm, I'm still got a half a glass of wine here. Like, what's right? happening? <laughs> yeah. So people are getting, so it's like, I've got this, I've got this timeline. Mm-hmm. What do you say to girls about that? Like I'm in a rush. I'm, I'm 35. I'm 45. I've haven't had kids. Yes. I get that a lot. I mean, there's a lot of empathy that you do have to have for that. Right. I mean, because Mm -hmm. I go back and forth with this because things are so different now, but there are questions like fertility. That's like a, that's a legitimate concern. And you know, like you can't brush that to the side completely. Right. But if you are concerned, and I'm sure you feel the same way, if you're concerned with your timeline more than the actual quality of the relationship, then you're trading one stress for another. Mm-hmm. I say this with anything. You're just, if you're trying to get rid of one stress, make sure you're not trading that stress for another stress. So if the yeah. stress is that you wanted to be married by now, or the stress is that you wanted to have kids by now, you're just going to trade that stress for being with the wrong person. So mm-hmm choose your battle, I guess, <laughs> you know, like I, I, I won't judge somebody if that timeline really matters to them. Like who, who am I to judge if, you know, I think, listen, there are some relationships that are just different like that. For me, I need that, that love and that passion. And, you know, it seems like you're the same way, but some people, mm-hmm. they, they're, they're okay with their relationship being a little more of a business agreement and somebody that they can grow to love. And if you're okay with that, then I'm okay with that. I don't know. You know, if you're okay with that. I'm okay with that. But just, you know, 
don't trade one stress for another unless if you're aware of that and you're okay with that, but that's usually what happens. Mm, that's a great way to put it because it is another stress. So you can stress about the guy, you can stress about fertility, but trying to stress about both of them, mm-hmm. you really can't do them at the same time yeah. if they're not synced up. Yep. So going back. So before Joe, you, so you, you were, you were raised by a kick-ass single mom. Mm-hmm. So from, you know, high school dating, what was that like for you? And ha- because I can tell from your, you're speaking from like, I can tell, you know, the pain just in your content, you're able to speak to that pain, which is what makes you so fun. And you're so funny on your, I love your thank reels. You. They're just hilarious. I'm just like, oh, oh I love you. it. I love it. And so, and also to my girls, I have you on this podcast because I want you in their feed. I want you, there's, there are a lot of bad dating advice people out there, but there's so many good ones and you know, they can't listen to me all day. I want them to see different things, different perspectives. Like your whole, your whole perspective is, is different than mine. Or like, I'm just thinking like so many different things, which is, is stimulating, right? I just want them to be stimulated and just come at it from different angles because look, we all don't have all the answers, but if we can get our curate, our feeds Mm -hmm. to where, what we're scrolling is feeding us the right way, then that that's, it's amazing. So yeah, you're so funny and you have so many, uh, so many times where I'm like, I wonder what the story is behind that. (laughs) So how did you like between, I don't know, high school and Joe, like dating and where, what was that like for you? Did you have like a major heartbreak or a significant shift that put you into that mindset of having that interest in relationships or has it always just kind of been there? So, I mean, like I said, in high school, I I read the dating books just because I was really interested. I was always middle school, high school. I was always part of the popular crew, but I wasn't, I wasn't like the most popular of the popular crew. Like, you know, I, I, Mm -hmm. I never felt, I never felt like I really belonged with my friends. I always felt a little, me too. Yes. I don't know. It was so weird. And people, people will be like, okay, you're crazy, but that's how I felt. I didn't have tons of attention from guys when I was in middle school or high school, I went through puberty, like super, super, super young. And I had a woman's body at 10 years old. Mm. And like the boys weren't attracted to me. A lot of older men were attracted to me. And I I grew up in Brooklyn and I would, you know, be walking from the school bus to my grandparents' house. And I would get catcalled by like old men. Like it was weird. (laughs) Um, Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Like, like that, that was always so weird. So, but there, there was never, there was never a lot of dating. I had like one high school boyfriend for four months and that was really it. And then the next time I got into a serious relationship, I was just about to turn 18. It was the summer before I was uh, going away to school, which I only stayed away at that school for one semester because the guy that I got into a relationship with was extremely controlling extremely emotionally and verbally abusive, really, really bad. I lost pretty much all of my friends. I, this was in college. Yeah. So I, okay. I distanced myself from m- almost all my friends, a uh, lots of, lots of like my family. I mean, everything, it was just, I, mm-hmm. I completely distanced myself. Um, and this relationship really just like stripped everything for me. I don't know why I was just so a- afraid to let it go. I, I guess I figured I kind of just let everyone go. And then as time went on, I was afraid that my friends weren't going to want to be friends with me anymore. And, you know, whatever. Mm. So I I gained a little bit of confidence. I mean, that, that is like a whole episode in, in itself, but that lasted about four and a half years. And then when we broke up, I finally broke up with him. I was so relieved that I didn't even shed a tear. Like I was just so done and so relieved that I didn't even cry. Like I just broke up with him and I was so happy, but I was like a, an animal let out of a cage. I was 22 years old and I never Mm. had like that, that experience. And I felt like I was missing out and I had to catch up to what my friends were doing Mm -hmm. in college. So there was a lot of partying and, and guys, you know, like it was just like stupid stuff, but just, I mean, just casual. And after about a year of being single from that controlling relationship, I realized very quickly that, you know, guys were kind of (laughs) shitty and Mm -hmm. I got into another relationship after, after a year. And then that I was only in another relationship then for a year. So from like 23 to 24 years old. 
and he cheated on me. Mm. And I wasn't, like I said, the relationship before that was four and a half years and I didn't cry a single tear when we broke up. But when I got cheated on, I was like sick, like physically ill for six months. Um, <sighs> yeah. And it's so weird. Cause I look back now and I'm like, I didn't, I didn't love this person. Like, you know, you think of like the, the, like what, what you trick yourself into thinking and what you see, because when something is so tumultuous, you almost make yourself think that it's better yeah. than what it is. It like gives you a high. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I fell back into the same cycle. It was like, I would rebel. I would go through a breakup and then I would rebel. What would they hate if I did right now? And it was just partying and, you know, casual dating and all that stuff. And it wasn't very fulfilling. You know, I think girls these days are sold this sex in the city dream where you're just hooking up and hanging out and you don't care and life is great. And it's like, most of us are not built to do that. Right. So, um, yes, so yes, I agree. It took me a while. It took Mm -hmm. me a while after that. I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, probably for two or three years after that, I was just doing the same thing, partying, but just kept a wall up. I kept a wall up and it would, it it would be one of those things where I would say that I wasn't looking for anything serious because I wanted to make myself believe that and that I could just be cool and go with the flow. And then, you know, and then I'm crying because, you know, somebody doesn't like me back and it's like, well, you said you wanted to go with the flow. Uh, Right. um, Yeah. So I, I, I finally, I made like, just a promise to myself. I was like, I'm done. I'm spending, I decided to start spending time at home. When I tell you I was out every night of the week doing something, whether it was like at a bar, even if it's just hanging out with friends at a friend's house, I needed to be with people all the time. I was afraid Mm -hmm. to miss out. Um, I finally just made a decision after, you know, a a few years. And and I was like, I'm not, this isn't fulfilling for me. I didn't even say like, I want a relationship. I was just like, this is not fulfilling. It's not getting me anywhere. I started just staying home, taking care of myself and just like truly doing things that were nurturing to me. I was sitting home and putting on a face mask and watching like a YouTube video and just like, just spending time alone. I was taking, how how did you, how did you decide to do that? Was it just like, I'm sick of it. Did you just happen to start? So you like, you, you started taking care of yourself just out of exhaustion of the whole game that it felt like I'm out, I'm doing all the, um, I'm doing all the things and I'm exhausted. Yeah, because what here's what, what's happening is I, I feel like it's a, it, it sounds like we've had similar but different experiences, right? You were pro- you, were you like the, like going on lots of dates? Like you were going on like you, you know, um yes and no. Like okay. my, many fewer than I I would lean more toward like we have very similar stories, probably why I've been enjoying watching your content. <laughs> like I relate to you a lot where I was in the popular group, not really that wasn't the it girl. And I didn't date very much in high school never went to the prom. So, you know, everyone could feel sorry for me. I never got into the prom. <laughs> I, I kind of hate that. It's like a little sore spot. And then, yeah, so I dated, but it was not a lot. It was not, I was not a serial dater. I would, I would go online. I'd go on a few dates. Um, and then I would get fixated on one guy and then, you know, and that would turn into a relationship sometimes. So, you know, as I've created this content and I'm doing it with my boyfriend now, I'm like, oh God, there's a lot of guys to refer to. I mean, so there's, you know, I've dated a lot, but not, yeah. I was not like the sex. I'm, I want to make sure we come back to sex in the city because I yeah. do agree that lifestyle and just that show was such a fixation on yeah. being single. Like when you, I don't know about you, if you watch it back mm-hmm. in this mindset, it's like, this is a really depressing show. Yeah, it is. They're just obsessed with the fact that they're single. And if they're not, they feel like losers. And it's all about page six and being married and being like having the there. It's like, it's a whole show about chasing yeah. the fairy tale with the New York city background background. Yeah. No, yes. you're, you're right about that. You know, it's just like, you know, I was asking about you with the dating because with me and literally all of my friends, at least through our like mid twenties, nobody was going on dates. It like, isn't a thing anymore to go on dates. And yeah. that is so weird. And like, it's such a problem because that th- then there's like, there's no, there's no boundary. There's no line. There's no talking about standards or expectations. Mm-hmm. So it's just this constant 
thing where you meet people and you just, you have to just see where it goes. And like, I think that's a huge problem with, you know, younger people today and, and dating is that there is no dating. It just doesn't exist. So what do you think they're doing? Like, how do you feel like it's, is it just, we hook up, we hang out or what, what is the process looking like from your side of you might more millennials than I do as far as like, what is that looking like from a, from beginning to relationship? Are they just feeling like we're cool? We met up and now we're just going to hang out each other's houses. Yeah. So what I find to be really popular is your meeting. It's always going to be like, somebody who is a friend of a friend somehow Mm -hmm. and you meet them at a bar and then you're like hooking up and then maybe you'll go to their house and then maybe one time you'll like go out to eat but then I I don't like titles and you don't like titles and let's just see where this goes there's just like not much structure it's not like you meet somebody while you're out like that part of it would be okay a friend of a friend great I mean that's how I met Joe right but then there's no there's no date Mm-hmm. ever. And even, I mean, I, I talk about this very openly. I mean, I met Joe and I thought we were having a one night stand like a hundred percent. I really wrote off. Guy, I wasn't seeing anybody, nothing like for, for like a year and a half. And I, that weekend, it was just, I don't know what happened. I, I thought I was like bringing home this time. We were having a one night stand and I'll tell, I will never recommend to somebody. Okay. Yes. You know, if you're looking for a relationship, have a one night stand, but here was the difference he did not contact me again to hook up. He contacted me a week later and said, Hey, I had fun with you. I'd love to take you out for dinner. If he said anything other than that, we wouldn't be together right now. Right. Right. That, that, that like date, that structure is just completely missing from Mm -hmm. the dating scene these days. And people only go on dates if they meet online and then they, they're, it's just, they're accumulating first dates. Yeah. And pen wow. pals. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Texting buddies, yeah. hookups, hangouts. So you feel like it's texting hangouts and hookups and just like a bunch of people that can't make a decision. Yeah. The, the amount of women that come to me that are so like hooked on someone who was, I'm like, you have a pen pal. This is nothing. You've just been texting for months and you haven't, you maybe hung out and got together one time and they're fixated on somebody who is a pen pal. It's so bizarre. Mm, Yeah. It's very bizarre. Yeah. Why do you think, where do you think the fixation's coming from? Because you're giving yourself too much time to create fairy tales in your head, Mm -hmm. not acting quickly. So, you know, this is even when it comes to hanging out and meeting up, going on a date very quickly after you meet, because the longer time there is between the talking and the, the meeting up, all that space in between is you fantasizing and creating a story in your head of what is supposed to happen. <laughs> yes. I have this phrase. I said, like, you're don't marry him before you meet him. We're right. marrying them before we meet them. Right. And then we've created a husband with a guy who might be texting from the toilet, you yeah. know? I always say, just imagine him texting from the toilet. It takes all the glamour out of it. Yeah. Like that could be the only time he's making time for you. Like step over glamorizing it. Like who yeah. is this guy? We don't even know, you yeah. know? And usually when you're not hearing from them, it's some kind of issue. It's a job issue. It's a money issue. It's a drug issue. It's I have another wife issue. Like they're not, re- <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. they have a girlfriend, they're on a dating site and they shouldn't be. I mean, there's to me, there's always a reason that he's mysterious. It's because he's hiding something that you would probably more than likely walk away from. Right. So yeah, but that's very, very interesting. So I, I think, uh, my clientele is probably more, I I'm still hearing about dates, mm-hmm. but I can see that declining just as, as the, as the age brackets get younger. Mm-hmm. So what do you feel like in the dates is missing? What's happening when we're not going on dates, when we're not going to dinner? What's, what do you feel like for the millennials listening? Cause I do have a lot of millennials that listen as well. Like what, what do you think, what are they selling themselves short of? So, you know, we, we did touch on this a little bit before where, right. Like, you know, people will go on dates and, and they're like, what are you looking for? Right. Mm-hmm. That conversation still should be had, but you know, in, in a different way, but it still should be had. 
It just mm-hmm. shouldn't be as sterile. I mean, you know, right, right. Do a little dance, like, you know, put, put a little flair on it, but nobody's having those conversations because there is no structure to how you're hanging out. There is no standard to what you'll accept when it comes to going on dates. Right. So if you set this standard or this expectation of what you're looking for from the beginning, and that starts with what you'll accept as a first date or, you know, and not a hangout, a date, a proper date is what you should expect. And you have that, then you're able to have that conversation from the beginning when it starts off so extremely casual, that's where it's like, where do you fit the conversation? And it feels like it doesn't go. That's when you feel crazy for bringing that up. You're only going to feel crazy for bringing that up. If it's not an appropriate situation to bring it up. Oh, that is brilliant. If it's so casual, then the proper order and sequence just falls apart. Right. I mean, like I said, I brought, I brought Joe home. I thought I was having a one night stand. And at the time I was living in, I was living in Jersey. I was in Hoboken. I was like new to living there. And he was like, oh, it's kind of nice over here. I said, yeah, next time you come, you could take me out for dinner. And then he texted me to take me out for dinner. If he texted me, you know, two nights late, later on at 2 AM. And he said like, Hey, what are you doing? You want to hook up? I would have said, no, thank you. <laughs> That's it. And that would have been it. Like, yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. You, get it. you need a little bit of that, mm-hmm. of that structure there. And, and there's, there's a lot of, you know, we talk about toxic dating advice. I mean, people who are so judgy to those who, who have standards for a first date, like some, some women say they don't want coffee and they, they want to be taken out to dinner on a first date. And, and Mm -hmm. while I don't always think that that's necessary, it's like, I'd rather somebody have standards that are set pretty high than settle for whatever people are settling for now. Right. Right. So, okay. Do you feel like, because I have actually a really good friend who had her second child with her one night stand, (laughs) they were like, (laughs) they actually did continue to hook up. Although I can't imagine it. Cause he's like the nicest guy in the world. I feel That's like so he funny. really was like in love with her from the beginning, but <laughs> I just, he, they just do not look like a hookup couple, but it, it, it does happen. Yeah. But would you say it's rare, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, rare. it's rare, but it can happen. So I know I always tell girls like, don't, if it happens, don't beat yourself up because then you just feel worse about yourself right. and then your, your self-esteem suffers. But okay. So I, I have a little debate going on in a DM. I want to get your opinion about this. Okay. So when it comes to showing up, okay. Showing up online, showing up as far as sexuality and sensuality. So if I'm going to show, how can I phrase this? Because this is a longtime client of mine and she's beautiful. And I know she wants a relationship, but she's very sensual. Mm -hmm. And she, she posts some pretty sexy pictures on Instagram. So she's got sexy pictures on Instagram. I don't really know what she's sending. She's like, I don't want to send these pictures and be so forward in a text message conversation. But I was trying to have the conversation with her that if you, if you come to the date and you lead with sex, I feel like you're going to get guys that are going to pursue you for sex. So if you want the relationship, what is your opinion on, I want a healthy relationship. I want to find a husband, but I am a sexual girl. I am sensual. Why can't I show that part of me? Do I have to filter that out? And so I'm, I'm having that. I just, I just want to hear what your take would be like, what's, you know, it's like, is it too much? And then we feel like we're placating the guy. Like I'm pretending like I'm not sensual. So he'll think I'm virtuous. And it's like that whole game of, well, you're not trying to be pretend like you're virtuous, but where, where is that line of, okay, girl, if you put it out there, you know, if you got your boobs spilling out and you know, your ass cheek is showing like, at what point is that where it's like, you know, it's such a hard, it's such a fine line because I want her to be herself yet she wants a relationship. So what would you, what would your take be on that? So it's like I said before, it, this, this, that's oversharing, but oversharing with your body. You need to let somebody earn the privilege of getting to know you. And that doesn't allow them to earn that privilege. She can still be sensual on a first date without wearing something totally provocative. You're not telling her to wear a turtleneck. You're not telling her if she wants red red lipstick, don't wear red lipstick. You know, she can, I know this is, this is audio, uh, you know, I'm just being visual right now, but like she can like 
touch her collarbone while she's looking at her menu. Like there are ways with your body language to, to show that, that sensual side of you without being so obvious about it. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I, if, if it's in the question of, of sex and I, you know, I'll tell, I'll tell clients, you don't want to pretend like you're not interested in having sex with somebody that you meet, even, even though you want to prolong it from happening because you want to think clearly, you don't have to make it like you're the Virgin Mary and you don't like having sex. Instead, it's like, that is a very tempting offer. And like, I am super attracted to you, but I like to take things slower than that. Then it's like, Hey, then he knows, Hey, she wants to have sex with me, but she would prefer to wait. Right. Yeah. You know, so expressing. Um, right. Right. As far as like mm-hmm. photos, things like that, you know, the, again, the masculine and, and feminine energy thing can be really complicated. And it's way more complicated than e- either one of us could probably even describe. I mean, there's people who's, who are coaches just on that, right? It's so complex, but yeah. when you're leading with sex, you are leading with masculine energy and you don't even like realize that that's what it is. Mm. This is the way I like this take on masculine energy only because I mean, she's like, she goes, well, men are going to think about sex anyway. And I think it's a really good debate. I was, we were having this conversation on in DMS. And I was like, oh, this would be a really good podcast conversation in general, because mm-hmm women feel like, no, I want to be able to be my sexual self. And then it's like, but then I can't be too sexual because then it's going to matter. She said, men are going to think about sex anyway. I'm like, that's true. But I love that, that earning, having him earn that. It's a privilege right to see to her body. Yeah, right. But, and, and how about, how about this? You can even, it's, it's even as simple as this. Do you want to be right? Or do you want to be happy? Is that working for you? Probably not because we're still having this conversation in DMs. It's not working. What, what is it going to pain you that much to just try a different approach? Just try it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes yeah. you have to try a different approach. Right. You because know? when I'm, I've, I've coached her and I've met her one-on-one when I see her, it's like, and I, I look at the Instagram. So girl, you know who you are. If you're listening, like I don't see those two girls don't go together to me. And so I feel like we're trying to, so I asked her, are you trying to, because I will be honest there back in the day when I would go out, I wouldn't feel sexy enough unless I had a little bit of cleavage showing Mm -hmm. or I've got long legs. So I would flaunt the legs. I was always trying to hide the middle section. Oh, you're so lucky I have stumps. (laughs) Oh, well, I, I, I was like trying to flaunt what I had, but I've always, you know, I've always struggled with like 20, 25 pounds. So it's like, all right, I've, but I, I remember I remember, and I don't know, she, she's saying this isn't where she is, but I remember struggling with covering up because then I felt, I didn't feel sensual at all. It was like, okay, now I feel like I'm just going to wear a shirt that covers everything. I remember it feeling weird to me now. Now, if I have cleavage out, I feel like I I'm, I'm, I'm I notice it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm aware of it. And sometimes I'm like, you know, whatever. I mean, now I've my my boyfriend doesn't care what I'm wearing. He's like, what? Yeah. It takes me forever to get him to tell me which one he likes because he's just like, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> like, which one though? Is it the red or the black? But yeah, so I remember struggling with that, and I. This is again, I don't want to tell girls don't do this or don't do that. But there are some things that it's like, yeah, if you do that, he is going to think of a blowjob and I'm sorry, but that's Mm -hmm. what you're going to make him think of. And if you do that, but so it's like, but you don't have to be, it's like the Virgin Mary versus, you know, the seductress and, and balancing that. Mm -hmm. But like you said, I think there's something like as every woman, if I, and I was going to Texas where I think I will, like if, whatever is bothering you about this debate is probably where your own values is what you're struggling with your own way. You really truly want to show up versus the way you think people want you to show up. And yep. I think that's what she's struggling with. And so, because I know we're in such a, um, we don't want to do what men, you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to be what men want yet. We, if when you're looking for a man, you're bought, you're you're always balancing these ideas in your head. So when you met Joe mm-hmm. and you start developing this, how long have you guys been together? Three Is years. Three years. Okay. So what was that like when you finally started to realize, oh, this is it? Like this is the one. How um, was that different than everybody else? 
it was the most like peaceful, calm thing. Like I thought that there was something wrong. I kept thinking in the beginning, this isn't, this isn't going to go anywhere. Like it's, it's so calm. I felt so much peace and I was conditioned to think that relationships are supposed to be difficult and you're supposed to fight for someone's attention and like fight to make sure that they want you and they need to prove it over and over again through some sort of battle that you, that you put in front of them. It, It was just, it was so calm and it was so peaceful that just when I finally realized that it was like, this is actually adding to my life for the first time in my life and it's not taking anything away from me. And then another thing, it is just, this was just like a little thing, just any of the guys that I had dated previously, anytime I would bring them around friends or around family, they couldn't hold their own. And I felt like I needed to pay attention to them. And he and I, we went to go have dinner one night and we ran into two of my coworkers and I just like, I felt, I was like, I love this guy. Like he just was so like good with them. And it it was so important to me that he was able to do that. That now, even now I know that I could, we went, I was in a wedding last weekend where he didn't know anybody and I didn't feel like I needed to check on him. And and that was just like, I mean, that was just like a random moment, but but that's peaceful, you know, just like not Mm -hmm. having to constantly worry about somebody else and like, not feel like they're taking anything away from you. It was like, oh, Mm. I never had that. That's amazing. That's amazing. And that's what I just, it's like, it's so hard when you're looking for it. And I know how I used to feel when I would hear people tell these stories and then it'd be like, but when is it my turn? And so I want to share as many of these stories with my girls as possible, because I did this for a long time single, but I felt like I I knew, I don't know. I just felt it in my gut that my time was coming, that I was going to, and I ended up reconnecting with somebody that I had met five years prior. I was like, Oh my God, this guy's back five years later. And our lives were different. We reconnected, but, um, just to, to have faith in that it will come when it doesn't, it just feel like, Oh, this is what I was waiting for. Right. And, you know, people will say like, Oh, it happens when you least expect it. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. It happens when you're ready for it. And then you realize like, Oh, like I was kind of expecting it. I mean, one of my girlfriends said to me, she, she said, you manifested Joe. I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Like, what do you mean? And she said a couple of months before you met him, you don't remember. You said, I know I'm going to meet somebody soon. I just, I don't know. I know that that's, what's going to happen. I'm going to meet somebody great soon. And I did, I literally just Mm -hmm. stopped. Not even that I stopped caring. I just, I just, I remember not out loud. I'm not much of like an out loud affirmation person, but I remember saying to myself, I don't care if I never meet anybody as long as they're they're the right person. I'm happy. But if they're not, I just, I don't care. Like what's the worst thing that can happen. I don't meet somebody. Okay. (laughs) I know. I started to think the same thing. Like I looked at married people. I'm like, okay, it's not like they're walking around on rainbow cushions and, you know, unicorn. It's like they, they have, they have nice lives, but to me, I was like, it's not like, oh my God gosh, married people have the thing, you know, it's like, yeah, it's nice. But most of the time I was like, I wouldn't want the husband. I wouldn't, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I started just to really realize that yes, it would be nice, but my life wasn't that bad without it. You know, I was like, this is not that bad. And, and then when you make it really good, and like you said, you get to the point where you're like, you know, I don't care if I can live, we live in, you know, you and I live in the United States of America, we're free. We can have so many things. Like when you really count, I started to really count my blessings. Like I'm really fortunate to have what I have. And so just enjoying life, it does. It is amazing how, when those things start to click, but you're right. It's not when you least expect it, you are ready for it. You are preparing for it. And I love that you thought it was a one night stand. Cause I just feel like when it's, <laughs> it's meant for you, it will just be, it, it's almost like you can't chase the right one away. <laughs> it's, right. like it's just right. meant for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's just going to happen and it's going to happen. And you, your story is going to be you know, yours and my stories are different, but it's like the right guy. It's just like when you meet the person, you're like, Oh yeah. How would we not be together? Right. Like, right. I can't picture anybody weird. else. Yes, exactly. Okay. So I could talk to you forever, but I want to know <laughs> what, what have you created? Cause I know you've got some stuff coming out for programs for, for you've got your dream girl package coming out. So tell everybody what's going on. If they want to work with you, what's your, um, cause you have your waiting list for your wait list for your dream girl Academy, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, the best way is just to go on Instagram, uh, and find me. It can't get a text back. Everything that you would want to know about me is in my, 
uh, the link in my bio. I do take clients. I'm still taking clients. Um, if you want to just like get to know me before you make any sort of decisions, I have a free workbook. Um, if you just go to my website, it'll pop up there. It's how to manifest your dream guy ASAP, but I am taking a wait list for my dream girl dating Academy, which is going to launch in the fall. I'm thinking late September, early October. I'm working on that now. And it'll be, uh, it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be packed full of information. So it's really for anybody who's felt like they're being taken advantage of or not understood in dating. And they want to just take back the power and uh, date with confidence and attract a great guy. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, I'm so glad we did this. This has been we'll so much fun. Yes, we should do it again. I knew you're one of my people. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love it. So yes, can't get a text back all one word on Instagram. Yeah, it's it's a brilliant title. I'm so glad you snagged <laughs> it. That's amazing. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We'll put all the links in the bio on the podcast as well. And we'll be uh, sharing all of this uh when, when we release this podcast. So thank you so much for taking the time. This was so much fun. You're amazing. And I can't wait to watch this grow and explode. So thank you. Yeah. And we'll do it again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening. If you want more information or to schedule a private coaching session or better yet to join the next back to you Academy, go to gumballlove.com. If you loved this podcast, I would love for you to share it with your friends. And if you really loved it, a five-star review is the best compliment you can give. Remember, you are enough, you are right where you should be, and the only thing you have to do is keep going. I'll leave you with my favorite quote by Henry David Thoreau. Go confidently in the direction of your dreams and live the life you have imagined. Until next time, I'll see you soon.